Generally, what's your handicap? Don't mind church. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's why we don't play. Because uh, my I'm about a 14, I guess. So if we play, I'll need eight strokes. <laughs> yeah, I, I like to play golf. I'm not very good. Our pastor's good. My pastor's good, isn't he, Kim? I mean, he's like he he he's he's a scratch golfer. He he can shoot in the 60s. Uh, I can in sometimes in the in the winter time if it's you know in the 60s I, I can shoot in that but <laughs> no you know I had a dream about you last night I I don't put a lot of stock in dreams I I mean it, it could be pizza it could be you know I just don't put a lot of stock in dreams but I dreamed somehow we both died and we were in heaven and uh, we I get to heaven and he says, well, now, before you come in, uh, there's some stairs over there. And he pointed some stairs like they just went off into the distance. Just, he said, you'll need to take this piece of chalk. And it was a big piece of chalk. It's probably this big. And put an X on every step for every sin you've ever committed. And when you've done all the steps, then you, then you can go in. I'm like, wow, that's going to take a long time, you know. But... I'm making my way up these steps, and somebody stepped on my fingers. And it was Brother Bill. And I, I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going down to get another piece of chalk. He said, <laughs> ran out of chalk. <laughs> no, you know. <laughs> no, we're, we're, I think we're going to be good golf buddies. Uh, you know, um, I don't know how I got involved in deliverance ministry. People actually ask me that question. So, well, how, how did you, how did you get involved? And I, you know, it's like God tricked me. Uh, I wasn't looking for this. Uh, I wasn't looking for prison ministry. When uh, I was in the seminary, I'm a Southern Baptist, by the way. And you say, yeah, we could tell you weren't jumping around. And <laughs> I'm just, I mean, I'm just, that's just the way I am anyway. I go to an exciting football game. I just sit there and watch it. I'm just, that's just kind of my nature. I feel it in my heart, though, when, when people are jumping and so on. But uh, when I was in the seminary, I thought I was going to be the next Billy Graham. I mean, that's what I thought, you know. You just... Uh, studying you make your grades and you graduate one day and they rent you a big stadium and there you are <laughs> and uh, it, it didn't work like that but uh, I didn't know you know I was just willing and uh, but I didn't know I was going to ever be in prison ministry I've been going into prison since 1974 uh, not so much now uh, I, was in, I was in one about a month ago with uh, Tommy and Latrice and Fred and Esther, but I'd go in, uh, I'd, I'd be preaching in prisons 150 times a year, maybe. I've seen, I've seen some stuff. I've been, I've been to two executions. Spent the night uh, right outside the cell of a man who's going to be executed at 7 o'clock in the morning. I was there from 7 o'clock the night before. I've seen some stuff. Uh, David Berkowitz, the so-called son of Sam, Yep, some of you heard of him. He's like one of my best friends. He's saved. I've seen God do some stuff. And uh, I wouldn't be here tonight if I didn't know this was real. You, uh, you couldn't pay me to drive around the corner and do this if, if I didn't know it was real. I know it's real. I know God's bigger than your problem. I know he cares about your problem. I know he knows how to fix it. And it's not a secret. It's, it's really not a secret. Jesus talked about it. And uh, I mean, all through the word, you know, like a third of what he had to say had to do with healing and deliverance. Think about that. But do you hear it from the pulpit and in the Sunday schools? And No, we don't talk about it. 
uh, I don't know. I, one reason is preachers are scared. They're afraid somebody's going to get upset. And, you know, I, I don't know. But preachers don't talk about it. Sunday school teachers don't talk about it. If you want to break up a conversation, you start talking about it. People just excuse them. So, I, you know, I got to go. Uh, I mean, I'm telling you, you say the D word, it's just silence. Well, you don't think I would. You're not talking about, uh, you don't, you're not inferring. I don't talk to people about it. If they ask me a question, I'll talk to you. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ever come up to anybody and say, you know what, you got demons. <laughs> but people think you know. People think you can, you're like a scanner, and you can just. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you really don't. Uh, but sometimes people think that. Now, people come to our office sometimes. Say, well, I, I want to meet with the person that flows in the gifts. I'm like, what are you talking about? You think this has to do somehow with me or Fred or Nesta? You missed the whole thing. It's all about Jesus and his name. And it's not about who flows in the gifts. That term just cranks me up sometimes. What are you talking about? The gift is the name of Jesus. That's, that's the gift. And uh, anyway, I, I didn't know anything about deliverance. And I've been preaching in prisons. and I've seen people saved. I've never seen anybody healed. Now, if you're Southern Baptist, you know how to preach salvation messages. I mean, you, know, you just know how to get people saved. Thank God for that, you know. I'd see, I, I bet I've seen 100,000 people saved, inmates coming down the aisle, 100,000. But I had never seen anybody healed. I really, I don't guess I was even expecting or looking for it. I don't, I don't know. But I, I kind of wanted it. I knew it was real. I just never had experienced it. One night I'm, I'm, I'm leaving a prison down in Three Rivers, Texas, way down below San Antonio and up from Corpus Christi, right off of Highway 37, a federal prison. And I'm preaching. I don't know, there maybe 200 guys there in the chapel. And, but I noticed something unusual. There was an officer seated in the chapel worshiping with the inmates. That's very unusual. There might be one stationed in the chapel. But this guy was, you know, he's just raising his hands and singing and so after the service, he kind of came up toward me and he told the guy on duty, he said, I'll walk him to his car. I want to talk to him. And so federal prison, they got on their gray pants and maroon ties, white shirts, and that, you know, that's their, their uniforms. So we're walking out across the prison grounds and he's telling me he's a Christian and he lives in Beeville across, you know, and, I'm telling him I'm going back to Corpus. Uh, my wife was actually with me, and she was there at the motel. And I, we just talked a little bit and had prayer in the prison parking lot. He told me the reason he was in church is he's studying for the ministry. He said, I'm going to be a chaplain someday or a Christian counselor. So his name was Warren Reb. So I left, and I'm headed back to Interstate 37 and then to Corpus, and he's coming back and he's going to cross 37 to Beeville and I stopped at this little you know uh, kind of like a 7-Eleven I was going to get uh, probably Fritos and a Dr. Pepper I, I, you know but I stopped well he, he comes wheeling in behind me and he just comes bouncing out of his car he's like T.D. Jakes he's just like get ready get ready get ready I mean he was uh, and he was like, let the window down, you know. You don't, say, you don't say roll the window down anymore, you know that? Your kids, kids will just look at you funny like, roll? What you, you, mean, you mean push the button? <laughs> anyway, he, he was giving that motion. So he came up to the car and he said, uh, brother, while you were preaching, God gave me a vision about you. He said, I have to tell you. Uh, he said, I saw this big black pot and uh, you were standing in this pot and there was oil just bubbling around you. 
not boiling, it's just bubbling around you. And all around this pot, as far as you could see, it was just a sea of sick people. And the stench was nauseating from their sickness as it went up into the heavens. And he said, then that oil began to bubble up and it covered you. And he said, as it came off your head and down your arms and touched the people, they were healed. And he said, get ready, brother. God's fixing to pour it out on you. I didn't really know how to receive that. They didn't talk to me about things like that in the seminary. I didn't, I knew what he was saying was real. I, I knew what he was sharing with me was real, but I didn't know how to receive it. I remember driving back to Corpus and tears running down my cheeks. I'm like, God, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to pray for sick people. I know how to go to hospitals and do courtesy prayers, but I never really expected anybody to get up out of the bed, you know. I don't know how to, I don't know how to let miracles happen like that. And it seemed like I didn't hear words. I don't think anybody else does either when they say they do. You might sense it inside, but it seemed like the Holy Spirit said, just keep preaching. Your job, just keep preaching. I kept going to prisons, kept preaching, and things started happening. I started getting letters from inmates that said, I know you don't know this, but while you were preaching, heat just came all over me. And I used to have this, but I don't have it anymore. I started getting letters from, all, from different prisons I went to, and I wasn't doing anything but preaching. But something happened. Something, something I can't explain. Something that's very difficult for me to talk about because I don't want people to think it has anything to do with me. I just, I'm just a recipient. And, but I began to see people healed. And I began to get bolder. And uh, I knew it was going to happen. I could sense it in my spirit. I could almost see a, a mental image of a certain person. I don't know how to explain that. It doesn't happen a lot, but I, that began to happen, and I've, I have literally seen. I'm not, and I'm not. Try, I'm just trying to get you to where I reach this point. Uh, I've seen probably every thing you might name by way of sickness. I've seen it healed. I'm talking about AIDS. I'm talking about deafness. I, I mean, just, just. I've seen it, and. Uh, I, I don't boast in that. I just, I just wish somehow we could get people to a point of just believing and not trying to force God and say, well, why didn't this happen? Why didn't just receiving, you know? That's all we can do anyway is receive. You can't, if you think you can make something happen, you're wrong. <laughs> I mean, you're just wrong. Had a lady in her office one day. She said, well, I don't believe in doctors. I just don't go to doctors. I said, you know what? I bet if you have a wreck on your way back to Ardmore, you do. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, but I mean, no. We need all of God's gifts and all of the people that God puts in our paths. We need their help, and thank God for it. But, I mean, don't be squirrely about thinking because you, you know, you didn't need a, what did I say earlier, a Frito, that now you're healthy and everything. Uh, <laughs> And anyway, there's a lot of misunderstanding about deliverance. And you know what most of it is? Most people believe it's a power encounter. God versus the little demons. Man, think about that. How is that a power encounter? It's always a truth encounter. And the power of the demon is the lie that you believe. It's all about truth. And so who qualifies? Who's got demons and who qualifies and how does it work? And do you know what? If it worked like a lot of people think, why wouldn't I be in mental institutions and hospitals and, and just yelling at demons? And, because it doesn't work that way. It just, if you think it does, you're just wrong. It does not work that way. Uh, man, we just shut them down. 
I tell somebody, just fly me over to Las Vegas. I'll close it. I'm... It doesn't work that way. So who qualifies? Who is deliverance for? It's for God's people. You say, well, but I'm a Christian. I couldn't have a demon. Man, I don't know how many times I've been put in the position of answering that question. Almost to the point, just don't even start that. <laughs> um, do you know who, who Jesus ministered to? Do you know all these people were that had demons? They were children of Israel. They were the seed of Abraham. Do you know who we are by faith? Children of Abraham. Deliverance is for the children. The children. Jesus came for, and we're going to read that now in, in Matthew chapter 15. This is so important to understand how the, what the principles are. And so in Matthew chapter 15, interesting section of Scripture. It says, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Now that's not Jewish territory. The people that lived there were not Jews. They were Canaanites. They were Greeks. They were Syrophoenicians. They, they were Gentiles. That's Baal country. I mean, that's Baal worship. That's filthy place. Do you know, do you know um, the city of Tyre? And in the Old Testament, it talks about the king of Tyre and relates him to being Satan and so on. But do you know how they made their money, what their income, how they got their income? Dye, purple dye. And uh, they discovered something about letting snails rot. and I don't, I don't know how it all worked, but the city stank. You can hardly, you can hardly go through the city because of the stench of the rotting snails so they could make purple dye. Anyway, it's pretty unusual that Jesus said, let's go up there in the Gentile country, in the stinking place, in Baal country. Let's, let's go up there. Do you know how far it was from where they were? Depending on, I know they didn't take American Eagle, so it's not how the crow flies. They walked. It's about 100 miles over the mountains and down the trails and around. And, and why did they go up there? The, they were non-believers. Now, there were probably a few of the Jews that lived there. But at any rate, that's where they were. Maybe, he was, maybe they were taking a vacation. It's on the coast. And maybe Jesus was just saying, well, you know, we, we need to get away from people. Because he did that sometimes. So we need to retreat. And anyway, they get up there. And in verse 22, it says, Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. She's bothering us too. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of Israel. I did not come for the Gentiles. That's clearly what he said right there. And then she came and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it's not me. It's not right to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. What had she asked for? Healing and deliverance. And he called it children's bread. He said, that's for the children. And you're not one of the children. So you don't qualify. That's pretty much what he said. He said, this is children's bread. And she said, truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. 
Be it unto thee as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole that very moment. When she expressed faith in Jesus Christ, he said, now you qualify. Now you got it. And right, he said, and that's great faith, that you're a Canaanite woman, that you're in the country of Baal worshipers, and, and you recognize. She used a Messianic term. She called him the son of David. So I don't know who you are. You're the Messiah. And she fell at his feet and worshiped him. He said, oh, you got it now. You're in now. Children's bread, healing and deliverance is for the children. So people say, well, you know, I got a, a wild daughter and can you just cast demons out of her? No. Not unless she wants to be. Not unless she recognizes Jesus Christ as Lord. I can't do it against her will or your will. And so it's children's bread and you have to qualify. And the way you qualify is recognizing him as Lord and Savior and Master and then it doesn't mean you get it just because you do that. You just qualify to receive it. But she got what she asked for. You know what? I'm going to come down there with you. I'll come down here. Oh, come down here with you. Um, because if, if you could just say, be healed in the name of Jesus. Why wouldn't I do that all the time? Why wouldn't I just go around, I mean, just stop at all the stores and go into hospitals and because it doesn't work that way. And if you think it does, you're just going to be disappointed. It's for the children, and it's bread for the children. And Jesus said, I didn't come to just, this is not for everybody. This is for the children. So that became a great truth to me. It was like a light came on. I said, oh, this is not about power. I mean, God versus the little demon how is that a power encounter? But I think if you yell loud enough, demons will go out. <laughs> it's not the way it works. And, you know, we got this image. I know you got this image because that's the image demons present. It's holding people down and hitting them with Bibles and talking real loud. And I said, come out. And the demon's like, I don't have to leave. She wants me here. She invited me here. I have legal permission to be here, and no matter how loud you yell, it will not cancel my permission to be here. It's about legal rights. And what would some of those legal rights be? What would give a demon a legal right to a person's life? Sometimes ancestry. Sometimes stuff that went on in your ancestry. And you're just born. And the demon says, I have a right to that life. I have a legal right by what went on in the ancestry. Angels have the same rights by ancestry to minister. But that might be a reason. It could be your ancestry. It could be involvement in secret societies, oaths and vows. And maybe you didn't take them. Maybe your granddad did. And it stuck. And the demon says, I have legal permission to be here. So I just keep on yelling, buddy. But I'm not going anywhere. And you know, we've seen, I've, listen, I've been doing this 17 years. If the number of hours I've spent in deliverance, if I'd spent those in college, I'd be a triple doctor and a PhD. And, and I'm not saying that boastfully. But I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours sitting down with people and going through the principles of God. Most of what is talked about in the areas of deliverance are not even close to truth. I mean, the demons just run you around the bush for hours, and you haven't even made a dent because permissions must first be canceled. I mean, first the person must be saved. They must desire deliverance. Some people come into our office, and Fred and Esther do this almost every day, but some people come to our office and they think something magic is going to happen, that we're going to do something for them that they can't do for themselves. 
And you know what happens a lot? Wives say, my husband really needs deliverance. <laughs> oh, okay. And then the husband will come and say, man, the only reason I came is because my wife really needs deliverance. Uh, we, do we hear that a lot? All the time. And, uh, but deliverance is for the children and the children who ask for it. She didn't just ask for it. She pleaded for it. She said, Lord, I, my little girl's grievously vexed with the devil. And can you imagine? Jesus just ignored her. Basically didn't say anything. And she said, Lord, I know who you are. I know you can do it. And I really desire it. Oh, you got it now. You got it now. I, I think the reason he's entire inside was because she'd been praying. I believe that's how it works. I believe she heard it. He heard her prayer and he made the trip and probably taught a whole lot to the disciples on that trip. Can you imagine? That's like walking to Waco or, I mean, over the mountains and to the creeks and you can't do that in a few hours. Was that five or six days or more journey for this woman whose daughter, innocent, hadn't done anything that we know of, but was grievously vexed with the devil. And we have a lady from, uh, she's not here tonight, but I have a lady that's coming from, uh, from Houston. And this is her testimony. I've had... Uh, Three miscarriages, and we've, we have two children, but we've had three miscarriages after those two children. And my little girl, almost the same, my little girl has seizures. She's grievously vexed with seizures. And she said, we can't figure it out. But we believe it may have something to do with our ancestor or our involvement in life prior to this. And I didn't say this to her, but I'm like, you think? I mean, you think there might be a connection? Absolutely. And so we had, we had some people, this, this is going to be for somebody that you're not, we had some people come. I don't know if anybody knows Jim Hagman. Anybody know Jim? Anyway, he's, he was part of our ministry for a while. And, but he and his wife couldn't have kids. They tried and tried, couldn't have kids. They came one night at a night of ministry and confessed that in, in prayer. Asked for, said there's something wrong somewhere, but we want so much to have children and we can't. And, you know, I just prayed for them. That's all, that's all I can do. But you know what his testimony is now? Is I'm going to have to have a vasectomy. We, we got like, we can't stop having kids. I'm serious. Jim Hagman tell you that. We we. We got more kids than we can handle. They just keep coming. But you know what? Do you think that there might be something involved there? Do you know what we see all at, I mean, just repeatedly we see molestation. The girl was molested, maybe raped, maybe, got it, maybe had an abortion. Something to do that invites a particular type demon. Maybe the guy was involved uh, with some things like that. But I know who that demon is. I've encountered him many, many times. He's a baby killer. Do you know who he is in the Old Testament? It's Molech, Moloch, statue. He's saying, come sacrifice your babies to me. I'm the demon. I'm the baby killing demon. Do you know we see how that demon gets in people's lives? something that happened to them, something they chose to do, uh, but he gets in. And what, what do demons do? Thank you, brother. You know what he told me before the service, Victor? He said, I'm going to be shadowing you everywhere you go. You're going to see me. And I just looked over there, and he's like, water. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I'll probably be back. <laughs> Can you give me a hot dog next time? <laughs> no, Brianna Fredo, yeah. Uh, 
I know that sounds strange to some people. But do you think there's some spiritual connection to things that we can't figure out what's wrong in our life? may not always be a demon. Maybe something that happened in demons caused some genetic imperfections in your ancestry. I mean, I don't know. But I do know this. We see it happen all the time. We see people confess, yeah, I did have an abortion. I never told anybody this, but I did. Ah, oh, well, something probably happened. I don't know that, but sure could have. Was Confess it. That's breaking the permission. I, I did it. I received your forgiveness, and I don't want any demon there is there by that permission. That's the key. It's a truth encounter. But you carry secrets, you know. I say, I can't talk about that. You don't have to talk about it. I tell people in, in deliverance, I say, you, you don't need to tell me. I don't need to know the details. But can you confess it to God? Can you admit it and quit it? You know? Can you drop it and stop it? Are you willing to turn around? Can you just say it? And sometimes people are, in our, in our typical prayer, we'll pray this tonight. We denounce stuff. We take it back. We renounce stuff. Yes, I did make a vow. Yes, I did say that. But I renounce it. I, I want just Jesus clearly as my Lord and Savior. Don't want anything between. That's not hard to do. But you get it to qualify for children's bread, you have to desire it and you have to want your life to be right. And we have, you know, we also have people come and say, you know what? I'm an alcoholic. I want to be delivered, but I'm not sure I want to stop drinking. I, I, am I telling the truth? Had, <clears throat> had a guy that drove six hours to our office. He's sitting there, and I'm kind of saying, you know what? I, I really appreciate that you drove so far that you really want to be free. We have people. We had people from Vermont last week. They come from all over the world, actually. But this guy drives 600 miles, and we're getting to ready to do the deliverance. And he said, I have to tell you something. Uh, I'm married, but I have a girlfriend, and I love them both. And I'm like, so what, do you want me to tell you that's okay? What? What do, you, what do you want me to do in this, in this? I don't know. I guess I know it's wrong, but I'm not ready to quit. I can't help you. Can't help you. You know, that's the, that's the key to deliverance. It's a truth encounter. You mean you want to be free and still live like the devil? You can't do that. That doesn't mean you won't fall every now and then. I'm not talking about that. But that can't be your desire is to remain in a, in a sinful condition. So breaking the permissions, qualifying. I'm a child of God. I qualify for children's bread. I can confess that, you know, I'm going to give you the number one, absolutely number one permission demons have in Christians' lives. Without doubt, I don't know how many times a week we see it, but it's unforgiveness. I'm going to tell you that is number one. If you can't forgive, you can't be free. There's not even, a, not even an in-between or a maybe. You know what Jesus said about that? And I'll say this quickly, but this was after Peter said, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive? You know, I... Three or four or seven? I mean, Jesus said, no, Peter. But he told this story. He said a man had a great debt, and he couldn't pay it. It was just, he, there's no way to pay it. So he goes to the guy that he owes the great debt to, and it was like, you know, millions of dollars. But he said, I can't pay this. But if you'll have patience with me, I'll do the best I can. And you know what? The guy forgave him. So I, forget it. I, I wipe out the whole debt. Now, you know what happened right after that? The guy that received the great forgiveness 
he went out and found somebody that owed him $18. Put his hands on his throat and said, pay me or I'll have you put in prison. You know what Jesus said about that? He said, find that man and deliver him to the tormentors. I know who the tormentors are. That's the number one permission that we've found that demons have to tor torment people. They won't forgive. They feel justified. Oh, I got to hold on to this. You don't know what they did. You don't know what they said. You don't know what my uncle did. You don't know what my aunt did. You don't know what my wife did. You don't know, man. It doesn't matter. You, you have to forgive. Jesus, do you know who, who forgave the great debt? We're the ones that had a debt we could not pay. And he forgave it because we asked. And then we go out and find somebody on our same level and say, oh, you shouldn't have done that. I'm putting you in prison. I'm holding you accountable. You never get over this. What have you gained? We had a, uh, this was in Tomball, Texas. And uh, I'm going to kind of hopefully wrap this up. Have you ever said that? I'm about ready to close. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I hear that a lot too, but uh, we were in uh, Tomball, Texas, and um, there was a lady in that service. She was, uh, she was just huge. She was so big she could barely get down the aisle. I mean, she's just huge. But she came, she came to the altar, and she said, I'm full of demons. And she was so big she had to sit, sit down and take a seat. And she said, I want to be free so much, but I can't forgive. Now, her family came with her. I'm talking about adult family, husband, maybe a son or daughter, but the married couple and their kids, and they, they were standing around this woman. And I said, oh, you have to forgive. I can't forgive. And we talked, and I said, well, why can't you forgive? And she said, it's my mom. And I said, well, you have to forgive her can't forgive her she said if I forgive she wins and I'm like oh no 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 when you forgive you win and so she said I can't do it I said just say these words after me and I was kind of knelt down beside her. I said just say these words I choose to forgive my mother she struggled, got those words out. You know what happened? Her entire family fell to the ground when she spoke those words. It's like somebody cut uh, chains loose from her family. The entire family fell to the ground. Now, I, I, I saw that happen. I know that's real. And when you break chains in your life, we see children set free because those are the chains that are holding them. Maybe the last thing. <laughs> there was a lady came from, uh, I think, San Angelo, not too long ago. Cherie, that's sitting out by the book table, took this lady through deliverance. And she said, you know, I'm really concerned about my son. She said, he has night terrors, and he wakes up and just screams and, so, you know, so on. And she said, well, let's, let's, uh, let's bind the spirits in your son. Do you know where that authority is? I'm the mother. I'm the father. Jeff Drott was preaching at Gateway Church one night. Uh, Jeff was one of the associate pastors. and He said he was downstairs studying for his message, and uh, he heard his son upstairs, same thing, having night terrors, and said he'd wake up and run into the wall and walk around the house. And He said, I heard him. And so I stopped and I started up the stairs and so I got about halfway up the stairs and said it was like the Holy Spirit said to me, how long are you going to take this? He said, I knew exactly what he was talking about. He said, I walked up to my son's room and said, I picked him up and held him to my arms and I said, never again in the name of Jesus. Never again in the name of Jesus. And he said, ever since then, it's just been... <laughs> Isn't that something? Well, this lady's here from Brownwood or San Angelo, and she's telling this same kind of story. So Cherie said, well, let's, let's bind that demon because if he has permission from your ancestry and you're denouncing it now, we're, 
we'll do that now. So they did. And uh, anyway, the lady got home, was telling her husband about the deliverance. And uh, the demon, sometimes demon, when I say manifest, I don't mean they show up and look like bats or birds. They, spiritually, that they are. They're, they're creatures of darkness. But this particular demon was speaking through this lady, and he described himself as a bat. They sound creepy, but that's really not unusual. So she gets home, and she's telling her husband, and he said, well, let's, let's ask her little boy if he's ever seen one of these. And he said, uh, have you ever seen a bat? And he said, no, Batman doesn't come in my room. And uh, she said, I, don't, I bet he doesn't know even what we're talking about. So they got uh, an encyclopedia or something that had a picture of a bat and showed it to him. And he said, oh, that's the monster that comes at night in the corner, but Mommy beat him up today, and he's gone now. That's what the little boy said. <laughs> I, that happened, didn't it, Nesta? Well, I mean, I, I could tell you stories like that. I'm going to tell you <laughs> one more. This, I, I just want to stir your faith and let you know this is real. I, I, why would I make up something like this? And why would I? I mean, it's just silly to do something like that. But a lady called me one day from uh, Allen, Texas. And she said, do you do del deliverance on children? And I went, yeah, you know, it's a long story. If the mom and dad go through deliverance first, because that's the source. I mean, that's absolutely the source. So this woman, by the way, her husband's on our board of directors now. She's a, a psychologist from, graduated from Texas Tech. Her husband's a dentist. And so they're, I mean, they're not stupid people, educated people, but their little boy, four-year-old boy, they could not, there's something wrong. She said, sometimes he threatens to kill me said his voice would change, so I'll kill you. said she picked him, and they'd taken him to child psychologist and, you know, doctors and therapists. And she said one night she picked him up and put him to bed, and she kind of held him over her head like this, and said his eyes kind of rolled back in his head and said, you didn't know I was here, did you? And uh, they didn't know what to do. That's, that sounds creepy, doesn't it? I'm talking about regular people. And... Most people won't talk about things like this. You know, angels that follow us around. I got a, I got a couple following me right now. Uh, <laughs> you know who they are? Follow me all the days of my life. Everywhere I go, they follow me. But we don't talk about stuff like that, but they do. And so I said, well, if y'all come, if, if the husband and wife go through deliverance, then we'll take the little boy through. They both came. Both had demons, mostly from their ancestry and involvement in secret societies and fraternities and oaths they'd taken and sorority, just stuff. But they had, they had some legal permissions. They denounced them. Demons left their life, and, uh, and now they do deliverance in their home. Uh, but anyway, they brought the little boy, and... This is what I told her and what I tell anybody. We don't, we don't do, we don't sit children down and yell at them and command demons to come out. We never do that. But I said, well, I'm going to do the deliverance through you, Mom. You just tell me what you hear when I'm giving commands. Okay, so she's sitting there and I'm binding evil spirits. That's what Jesus called them. The word demon is not even in the King James New Testament. You can't even find that word. It's not there. He called them evil spirits, foul spirits, unclean spirits. That's what they are. Uh, but demons are scary, you know. But anyway, so I'm, I'm binding unclean spirits in his life, and the mother's giving me the names. I mean, who are you? And the names are never like human names. They're names you couldn't think of in a million years. They're creative names. Do you know God named every angel? Think about that. Innumerable company of angels. He named them all. 
All got names. Michael, you know, they've all got names. So do the demons. They have names. You, you, can't cast, you can't cast demons out by saying, spirit of fear, go. And like the demons are saying, you know, there's 14 million spirits of fear. Uh, who are you talking to? They're, in, they're individual spirits. So we get their names. They don't like that. We said, no, I'm not talking to just somebody. I'm talking to you, demon. You're the one that's on trial here tonight. And so, anyway, she gave me six, seven, eight names. and So very simply, I just bound those spirits. I said, you had no longer have rights to, I want, well, the little boy's name is Ethan. I said, you no longer have rights to his life. Now, he's sitting there, four years old. He's running cars up and down his leg. Mm, you know. Like he's not even paying attention. Command those demons to go. You know what he said? Well, back to headquarters. And his mother said, what did you say? He said, back to headquarters. Four years old. And you know, he's, I guess, Ethan's, y'all met Ethan. He's probably nine today. But he's got this. Uh, his little sister was upstairs crying one day and you know, just throwing a little fit. And he went up to his dad and he said, Dad, you want me to take care of that? <laughs> and his dad said, yeah, go ahead. He just goes upstairs and he says, leave my sister alone in the name of Jesus Christ. Just got quiet. Isn't that something? Do you ever think you have that kind of authority in the name of Jesus? That the demons are, that they don't understand that they don't know they're defeated. They don't know that, that they're, they got you tricked and fooled. And as long as you don't know how this works, you're not going to ever get out of it. You think they don't know that? No, they also know this. Sometimes, Fred, I don't know you've heard me say this. Sometimes in a deliverance session, I'll say something like this. Do you know who I am? I'm talking to the demon. Do you know who I am? I don't mean do you know I'm Don Dickerman. Do you understand that I represent the living, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ who lives today and you, know, and you just go on. So, do you know who I am? Yeah, yeah, I know. You know how this works then? Yeah, of course they know. And you don't have any legal rights to this person, do you? Not anymore. Well, then leave in the name of Jesus Christ. Can we see that happen all the time? And and was Ann Carter, uh, Pastor, uh, what's your name? <laughs> he's one of my he's one of my golf partners, Carter Foster and his wife Ann. They're, they're pastors. Uh, she said, "What was this? Just a couple of days ago, is that the people filled out the form and uh, anyway went through deliverance with them. And you know what? It works. Uh, it just does. Some of these guys from uh, from Oklahoma." Uh, Works, doesn't it, Jason? It's real. Uh, just, I mean, it's just real. They know it's real because they've experienced. I don't know how many people are in their church. Uh, you don't have to tell me, but about half of them have been to our ministry. You know what? Because when you receive freedom, you can't help but talk about it. You can't help but tell somebody, look, man, this is not what you think it is. It's, it's not hard. It's easy. It's just... It's just getting your life clean and then commanding demons to leave. And uh, anyway, that, we're going to do that tonight. Uh, very simply. I mean, it's not, not difficult. We'll do it right where you sit. And I always, I always uh, tell the inmates, we do this in prisons. I always tell the inmates, uh, I want you to pretend we're in a courtroom. And God says, oh, not again, man. <laughs> you know, but... I want you to visualize, because this is what this is. It's a legal courtroom in the heavenly realm. All the laws have already been established. I mean, it's, they're set, they're established. I want you to just visualize Jehovah God seated upon the throne. And we're coming into his courtroom. And I'm going to be your attorney. I'm going to prosecute demons. And I'm going to represent you before the Father. I mean, that's really the way the scripture presents this. 
He's the righteous judge. And all the rules have already established. And when we get ourselves in line with his principles, uh, you know, all the things that are written, when we get it, we, we qualify for blessings. So I'm going to be your attorney. And when we bind demons in a moment, it's like putting them in handcuffs. They're bound. And they will obey. They absolutely will obey. If you want to be free, if you can confess, we're going to do a public prayer. Everybody can say it with me together. It's a simple confession. But we're making it to Jehovah God. I mean, we're confessing simple things. I am saved. I do belong to Jesus. Uh, I, I denounce unforgiveness, and we're going to say those things. But I want you to get that visualization that something's about to happen in the spiritual realm. Something's about to happen. And if you want it to happen, you can receive it. Now, this is what I know just from, I, I bet, I said that twice tonight, I bet. And I really don't bet, but uh, I, would, I would bet on this because it's really not a bet. I know it happens. But I've probably seen 25,000 people delivered. Just, I mean, just like we're sitting here. I, I know it's real. I know what happened. I know what's about to happen. I know some of you are already feeling some stirring in your midsection. Some of you are getting a headache and getting some tightness. And some of you are hearing a little voice, and you need to get out of here, man. You need to leave right now. Don't you need to go to the restroom? Go right now. They know what's about to happen. But don't be alarmed. If you're feeling something unusual, it's just nervous demons. That's all it is. They're not going to hurt you. They're not going to leave somebody else and come to you. It doesn't work like that. Think about it. If it did, would you ever go to Ranger Stadium and there's 50,000 people and you said, oh, man, it doesn't work like that. But sometimes we think that, well, what if they come out of somebody else? And there, there must be an open door. And you don't have any open doors. Don't worry about it. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a confession that qualifies us for children's bread. Then I'm going to bind demons right where you sit and command them to leave. Most often, they'll come right out on your breath. Something like that. Just let them go. Uh, sometimes coughing or, uh, I don't know. But it's not difficult. Just let them go. So I'm, I'm going to ask you to do this. Don't close your eyes. Don't bow your head. I want, it, I want you to kind of, are we on live TV? Not anymore? I was, I was going to go stand in front of the camera for <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, uh, it's not complicated. You know what? It's not even that serious in the sense that you don't have to be like super holy or you know, we just kind of make this, I don't know, we make stuff creepy when it's really not. It's God's principles. It's God's law. It's the name of Jesus Christ. Demons understand that. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer. You just pray it with me out loud, unashamed. It's maybe a prayer you prayed a hundred times, but we're putting ourselves in a position right now to qualify for children's bread. This is a prayer. Father, I thank you for Jesus. He is my Savior. savior. I'm so glad to be born again. I I am washed in the blood. blood. And I qualify for freedom. And And because you've forgiven me, me, I choose to forgive others. others. Everyone who's hurt me, lied to me, or disappointed me, me, I forgive. I repent of anger and bitterness and hatred, of rebellion, resentment, and revenge, of envy, jealousy, and strife, of lust, witchcraft, and idolatry, and all the works of the flesh I put under the blood of Jesus. 
I denounce the sins of my ancestors. I totally separate myself and cut myself off from all generational curse. I renounce all unholy oaths and vows, pledges and ceremonies, and choose to be free from those curses. I denounce and confess his sin, all unholy soul ties. For Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. He's my healer and my deliverer. I choose to be free and I will be free. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you know what that means? It just means you, you qualify. I mean, if you prayed that prayer, you're saved, and you've confessed those things, you qualify. So that's what I'm going to do right now is just pass out children's bread, and you receive it. I'm going to bind demons. I'm just going to, same voice. Uh, they understand. They know. And then I'm going to command them to leave. You just let them go. Some of you are going to absolutely be healed, set free, changed. It's, going, it's just going to happen because they were the source of the problem. So just keep looking at me, and that's what I tell, tell the inmates. Look at me like you're looking the devil right in the face. I'm coming out of this. I'm through with this. So I'm going to do that now. So right now, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bind every demon power any way associated with anybody in here whether in these people, attached to these people, or any way connected with their life. You're now under the authority of Jesus Christ, the living, resurrected Lord Jesus. You're commanded you will not harm anyone. You'll not leave anyone, go to someone else. You will not split, divide, multiply, fragment, or clone, or pass your duties on to other demons. You'll not call on others to help you. If you're responsible for any sickness, disease, or malfunction, disorders, you're commanded to put them back in order right now, just as Jehovah God intends them to be. This is the command of Jesus Christ. Now I command every, every prince, demon, every kingdom leader, pick up your kingdom right now. Merge it together as one kingdom. Come out of these people without hesitation. Go immediately and directly into the abyss. Do it right now in Jesus Christ's name. Go.